what do you find yourself having to explain over and over again? That AI is just going to take all the jobs. And I really do not think that's true. Again, every technology in history um, has created more jobs than it's destroyed. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Eric Chemi. Today, I'm excited to bring on Stephen McBride. He is the chief analyst at Risk Hedge. He is looking at all kinds of things happening in the markets, especially the impact of AI, not just what we invest in, but how we invest, the actual mechanics, the approach, the processes that are changing because AI is changing the way we can evaluate securities, the amount of computer power that's available to us to make smarter decisions. And Stephen, you're joining me from Ireland. So we got this across the Atlantic conversation happening here today. Thanks so much for spending some time with me coming on the show. And you're much smarter than I am, right? You're looking at AI, <laughs> finance, individual stocks, big picture macro, commodities. How does somebody even get to be that smart and educated in all of these different you know, aspects of the economy? No, Eric, I wasn't the one that, that went to MIT, so uh, I, I think you're ahead of me on that one. But yeah, it's it's great to, great to join you. Thanks you so much for having me. I think the interesting thing about looking at cross asset classes, cross industry, is you spot patterns, uh, right? So whether that's booms and busts in certain industries or just fast-growing you know, technology trends, which is what we, we love to invest in, love to invest in disruption. So the world is a fascinating place. Uh, super bullish on what's going on right now. So, so can't wait to talk to you today. Are you bullish or are you bearish? Just to, as a general starting place, you know, from what you're looking at. Yeah. So, I mean, look, I have to uh, put up my bias, first of all, which is I'm, lo I'm a long-term optimist, right? I think over time, things get better. Over time, stocks go up. But right now, I'm incredibly bullish, which is not a contrarian position right now, Eric. But it was a contrarian position back in January when all the Wall Street strategists uh, were calling for the first down year in, in 20 years. That was their prediction. Uh, we were incredibly bullish for a number of reasons, but uh, it's been a great year. And I think, uh, I think it's going to be a great year next year um, for, you know, for the reasons of, of, of where the, the AI tailwind and other stuff going on. Do you think it's just because of AI that we're up? I mean, a lot of people say the S&P 500 it's seven stocks that are moving this whole thing. And if they, those seven didn't exist, if not for AI and big tech, we would be down, right? We would be legit down this year. So the, the analysts, if you know what you say, let's call it even 10 out of 500 stocks, right? So we're at 2%. The 98%, they were right, right? We were down on the 98%, but those 2% were up just so big that they end up looking wrong. But you can make an argument that, in fact, the bearish case was generally right. So I think your best players always score the most points, the most goals, right? Which is exactly what happened this year. The biggest stocks carried the market. I certainly think AI has something to do with it, Eric, right? Uh, I don't think, maybe ChatGPT saved the stock market, right? Um, if you look at the earnings breakdown, the contribution from NVIDIA and other stocks, that's the reason why the earnings recession is over. Having said that, although the, the big players did the heavy lifting, there's a lot more than seven stocks that are up. I mean, I just looked at, at some stocks today that, that nobody even thinks of, and they're making all-time highs. What are some examples? What, what, what are you looking at there? Stellantis, which, which owns a, a it's, it's basically a car group of, of, of uh, different automakers. That's surprising. Um, home builders have been doing great. Uh, there's another one in, in Europe, Lindy, that makes industrial gases. That's been doing great. Uh, stuff like chemical uh, in, in the uranium sector, that's making, uh, I think, a 15-year highs or something like that. So there's, there's a lot, and there's, there's, there's tons of stuff in the, in the AI space that are not, you know, trillion-dollar companies that are doing well. So I actually think the, the biggest lie being told is that just seven stocks went up. I realize those guys are a huge percent of the S&P 500, uh, but there's been a lot of ways to make money this year. That's true, right? It's it's not just seven stocks, right? Like more stocks are up. I don't I don't have it off the top of my head. Maybe you do or don't. Of those five hundred, how many are up or down in the S and P? Do you know off the top of your head? I remember hearing a stat a couple of weeks ago, Eric, that it was um, I think it was something like two hundred S and P five hundred companies are up more than the index year to date. Or there was there was something along those lines. Right. Uh, I can't remember if it was, it was the S and P or the Russell, but. Basically, a lot of companies are doing quite well this year. And I think just zooming out for a minute, 
for, forget about the seven stocks and all that stuff. We took our medicine in 2022. 2022 was a horrendous year. It was one of the worst years for the stock market in recent memory. Uh, and, you know, I, I read this great book a while ago. It was called, it was a, a very good year. Or it was a good year. And it basically looked at the 10 best years of the stock market, the US stock market in history. And the common pattern was all the best years happen after terrible years, right? You just get that bounce back. And I would say to people that think we're maybe a little bit extended here, just go look at big tech charts and the, even the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ on a two-year time frame. We haven't even broken out yet, okay? We haven't even broken out yet. And I mean, NVIDIA is up a lot. But this time last year, it was in a 68% drawdown. So, you know, we, we've, we've come a long way, but uh, some would say we haven't even broken out yet. Some would say that's going to be the top, though. Some would say we're not going to break <laughs> out and that they, we're not better off than we were then, right? We've got higher interest rates. There's better risk-free opportunities. We're seeing the impacts of a possible recession coming. Others would say... We, we can't go above the breakout. That's going to be the top, and then we're going to collapse from there. That, that's an argument. Absolutely, it is. I think for me, the we took our medicine in 2022, as I said. It's actually remarkable that stocks are not down more, right? When you think about how much rates have gone up, that the, we had that earnings recession, uh, and you know, inflation, stocks hate inflation, right? Forget interest rates, inflation is the really bad one. Um, so to me, it's remarkable that stocks are not um, down more. I happen to think that we have the tailwind of a strong economy, which is really, really important for stocks in two ways. Higher earnings, and basically that translates into when you, you, know, when you get a recession, it's really bad for the market. There's a clear dividing line, okay? Um, we've avoided it so far, and I think we, you know, we, we have the all clear for the next couple of months at least. Are there, let's say, two or three major data points that you look at when you focus on being bullish? Is it, is it you know, the employment picture? Is it spending? Is it sentiment? What, what have you found that tends to correlate the most as a leading indicator, something that has predictive value? Yeah, look, I mean, I, for, for me, uh, the economy is, the stock market is not the economy, but over time, the two tend to, to, to go up and down together, at least in the US. Uh, I'm very, very focused on prices. I understand that, you know, prices are current and they don't have, I, I would argue that they actually do have predictive power because of momentum and stuff. Um, so I'm very, very focused on prices. And as long as you have that solid backdrop of strong earnings, and a strong economy, that makes me bullish. Prices of of the securities. Securities, okay, not prices of things that we buy in the store. You don't mean those prices? <laughs> no, exactly. Prices of securities. They, you know, it's human nature. Things tend, things trend. Uh, us as men, we go and seek things that are moving. You know, nothing drives, no, you, you know, nothing drives narrative. Nothing drives sentiment like price you can almost think of stocks as like veblen goods the higher they go the more people want of them right the higher yeah. price they are the more people want of them so um to me it's hard to look at the charts now and say um it's time to be bearish i i think i think we we, we took the medicine um and uh yeah we're we're, we're going to be off to the races if we break out to all-time highs i don't think any technical analysis book ever told you you sell you sell the breakout you usually buy the break. This is this is where I get confused, right? Because a lot of people will say, you you stick with what's working, right? So things that are going up, you want to stay along those things. And the things that are going down, you want to get rid of those things. Those are your losers. Don't hold on to losers, right? But other people are, will say, no, everything mean reverts. So you want to sell highs, you want to buy lows. I haven't figured out what's the right philosophy here. Do you have a sense for, you know, when you see something making new highs, is that time to get out or is that time to add in? Because it feels hard to buy at the most expensive price something has ever been. That's, that's a great question of human nature, Eric, because I saw a great chart the other day and it was this was just for the S&P 500 as a whole. But basically, you made more money on a one, three and five year time frame buying at all time highs versus any other time. So in my opinion, all time highs are just stepping stones to more all time highs. Now, when you look at individual stocks, OK, that, that can break down a little bit, right? Um, for me, things things do trend. I think uh, you know I like to buy stocks that are in uptrends that are making people money, where a lot of people are in the money already. 
Uh, Paul Tudor Jones has that great quote of losers average losers, right? Um, and I think unless you have a variant perception, a reason why something is going to change, an upcoming catalyst, you generally don't want to buy stocks in downturns, or at least I don't like to. So there's lots of ways to to to, to bake the cake. Uh, I, I like to be in things that are making people money already. So so by the way, I know when we were talking before, you were in New York, you know, not not too far from me, and you were filming your conference and and, and just just the other day, right? Like you just got back to Ireland. The conference is now available. What what did you learn there? You know, how can people find it if they weren't there in person? What what happened there? Because I wasn't able to go, but I'm curious. You had a lot of smart voices there. Were they generally bullish, bearish? Or what can you share with us and how can people find more, you know, if they want to dig deeper on that conference? Yeah, just to just to take a step back and really tell people what the conference was about, Eric, it was about AI, artificial intelligence. And if anyone's listening to this that's maybe skeptical of AI, I was an AI skeptic too. Uh, AI is nothing new. It's been around you mean since... all AI or AI within <laughs> investing? Uh, I think all, all AI, because okay. when I saw, for the longest time, Eric, AI was promised to change everything. And I'd read these articles about how AI was going to be great and it was going to change the world. And when I went to look for actual products that were working and making people money based on AI, they were few and far between. Okay. Again, this is, this is a trend that's been around since 1956. We've had lots of AI booms and busts. Okay. And I think ChatGPT, which I would remind people is just a year old, that was the coming out moment of AI. It was the moment that it came out of the, you know, the bells of college research departments and came onto the consumer stage. And um, you've obviously seen that have a great deal of impact in the stock market with stock prices. You now, for the first time ever, have companies actually making money from this trend from real products. So it certainly changed what we invest in. And I think a lot of people might have missed this trend. Uh, I think people were, were generally skeptical. They were a little jaded from the past couple of years of maybe they think crypto didn't work out, the metaverse, that was a scam. Uh, and VR, AR, they haven't taken off. I think people might have missed the AI event, so or, or the, the AI uh, uh, you know trend. So what we did is we wanted to put together a special event to really show people why AI is for real, why you need to be allocated to it. Uh, and again, we just recorded this big big event at Columbia uh, University. Um, hundreds of people have, have have already watched it. It's just out. We've gotten great in feedback. And anyone listening now, they can watch it on demand. Um, and just to, you know, why would you watch it? Why is it worth tuning in? We we give, you know, I give five top AI stocks to invest in now. And also on the disrupted side, we love to invest in disruption, Eric. Uh, five companies that are being disrupted now, you know, big popular stocks. So again, my biggest, you know, my biggest frustration right there now is that there's a lot of misinformation or bad information about AI out there. We want to give people a clear picture of what's going on and how to make money from it. So what are, what are those five stocks I should be investing in? <laughs> well, people have to watch the event to, to find <laughs> out, Eric. All right, we'll get, we'll get the links. We'll get the links up there. You should see it on the screen here and in the comments and the description and all that. We'll get those. We'll get the links. So I thought I might sneak it out of you. I, might, I thought uh, I might fool well, you. I, I will give you one thing, Eric. I think there's distinct, when you look at all technological revolutions, there's really three distinct phases that you want to pay attention to for okay. investors. There's the infrastructure phase, okay, where all the infrastructure, the backbone of the networks or even railroads and canals are being built out. And then there's what you can call the operating system or the platform, uh, you know, phase, that's phase number two. And then there's the apps, okay? We have some apps today, and maybe Microsoft is emerging as a platform, maybe OpenAI too, but really where the big money is being spent right now is in the infrastructure build out of that. Right? It's the chips, it's the networking equipment, it's the server racks. Uh, Microsoft alone is going to spend $50 billion on its uh, building out its AI data centers next year. Right, One of the largest build outs of any technology we've ever seen. So I think for right now, that's really where people want to focus. Think about that number, $50 billion that one company is spending just on data centers. Right, $50 billion is more than the GDP of many countries. It's more than the market cap of major, major brand names we're talking about. And that's just one company's data center spend for one year. Right. 
Right. It's incredible. Been, incredible. So, so tell me, because that it's so, you know, things is what I wanted to get into with you because I know I, I see your work online, on Twitter, on riskhedge.com. You're talking about AI a lot. How is it changing? I, I guess you've sort of answered like what we invest in, right? Like you said, the three phases. I think you've answered that. I think the conference will have those specific, specific stocks in there. But how is it changing how we're investing? Is it changing the models? Is it changing the you know, separate from investing in AI related companies, but using AI to figure out how I should just trade in general, because, you know, we've seen target dated funds. We've seen that 60, 40 stock bond split. We've seen all those sort of basic algorithmic type of ideas, but it's getting so far advanced that now you can have a portfolio of thousands of companies and each one gets a little micro weight and a little tweak in a hedge because the computers can do that for you. Are you seeing AI change that approach? Just how do you run a portfolio? Absolutely. I mean, look, finance, the stock market is the greatest game in the world, right? So the finance guys have been very ahead on machine learning, very ahead on, on quant stuff. I think you get at such a great point when you talk about how it changes, you know, how it changes we, uh, how we invest. Because the biggest gains from AI might actually come from using the technology, not investing in technology. I think we can make a lot of money, but I think even the bigger gains for you, for your children and so on, might come from using the technology, which if you think about it, that's actually quite unique. Um, I don't think a lot of people use crypto. The, the metaverse was not here. And even when you think back to other technologies, they were not like in your hands. Um, I, the best way we've found how to use AI is almost like a junior analyst, right? That that work that can work twenty four seven. Not you, the, not not a chief analyst like you, but a junior Stephen. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Something someone you can task with lower level tasks, Eric. For example, if you're looking into a new industry, right? Semiconductor, you know, wafer, wafers and or semiconductor equipment uh, industry, you can go and ask ChatGPT or Bing or whatever, and um, Give explain this industry. Give me the main players. How much revenue did they earn last year? Uh, what's the competitive dynamics between them? And explain all that like I'm I'm five, and it gives you a super simple breakdown of exactly what's going on. Um, I would remind people. I would encourage everyone to use the technology, and I would also remind people if you think it's a little clunky, it doesn't work. Take your time to play around with it. It's powerful, and remember, this is the worst it's ever going to be. Right, the rapid improvement in this stuff is is just remarkable when you think about ChatGPT to GPT four and so on. And um, so, above all else, this is really a incredible product productivity tool. You saw coders who use Microsoft Copilot; they get tasks done in 55 percent less time. You've seen the same across consultants. Boston Consulting Group just did a big study with Harvard. Um, and you've seen it with writers. So you can use it for so much. You can use it to proofread. You can use it to write copy. You can use it to edit. Um, and you know, if you're working at one of these big hedge funds, of course, machine learning, recognizing signals in the market is key. But for most most of us, uh, you know, that, that don't work at big funds, I think the best way to use it is like a junior research analyst that does a lot of the the heavy lifting, the grunt work for you. When I hear all this, I wonder. Is this going to be a job killer? When you think about your macro perspective, is this is this bad for growth, bad for jobs? Is it going to kill employment? What's the big macro impact if all of a sudden you've got a free junior analyst and now you don't have to go hire? So I think, yeah, two, we'll, we'll take the two things at a time there. The growth, first of all. Um, I think overall, this is incredibly, incredibly good for specifically the American economy because America is uniquely enabled, uh, uniquely set up to adopt AI. I think when you talk about concerns that people have, um, why do they have those concerns that AI is going to take all the jobs? I think it's because for the past 15 years or so, we've lived in this low growth regime, right? Everyone seems to think the economy is a zero sum game. If you succeed, I lose and vice versa. I think that's the wrong way to think about it, especially with AI. Um, when you think about GDP growth, right? Economic growth, it's just simply population growth plus productivity, right? And today it kind of feels like a, we're stuck in a rut, Eric, right? I mean, when you look at the demographic trends and even, even the debt, you think, oh my God, there is no way out of this. And I think AI is going to 
be a huge productivity boost to the US economy. And it's actually going to solve a lot of these seemingly unsolvable problems that we have. Again, you look at coders. This is just one segment of the economy that they now get tasks done in half the time. I think co-pilots does that mean are really... we need half the coders then? Does that mean we only need half the coders if they can get it done in half the time? So I have an interesting one for you, Eric. When Excel came along, right? There was all these stories of um, how, oh my God, this tool is just so incredible. I can now do a week's work in an afternoon. And right. of course, what happened when Excel came along? We now have a record number of accountants, a record number of business analysts, a record number of financial analysts. If people want to look up something interesting, there's something called Je Jevons Paradox, which is essentially um, the cheaper you make something, the more of something you have, the more of it, that thing you use. So for me, I see AI enabling us to do higher level tasks, way more stuff that could not have been done before. So that's actually going to create more employment. Okay. Yeah, you could think of it more like Google, right? You think of it like, now I don't have to go to the library. I could search stuff. I could get more information more quickly so we could all get more information more quickly. AI feels something kind of like that. I can get more information more quickly, right? And it's it's like what the search engine did to replacing having to go to the library to get information or having to look it up in the newspaper. Yeah, I mean, look, we've been deploying game-changing technologies for centuries, yet pretty much anyone who wants a job today has a job. And I would argue the quality of those jobs is better than ever. And um, if AI caused mass unemployment, it would be the first technology in history to do so. Um, and I think the big thing here, Eric, is that it's easy to imagine what jobs could go away. And there absolutely will be some jobs that go away, right? But on the whole, we're going to gain. It's way harder to imagine what jobs are going to be created as a result of this new technology. It's just kind of like if we were talking in 1990, there would have been no way for us to predict um, the podcasting jobs and social media manager and digital marketing, you know, vice president. Yeah, all those jobs exist today. So that's that's the problem that we have, right? True, like this, this, what we're doing right now wasn't possible, wouldn't have existed before. You mentioned the US is perfectly positioned for that. Are there other countries or industries that you see are better positioned to take advantage of what this AI is going to be? Yeah, so first of all, I think it's just worth spending a moment on America. Entrepreneurship, innovation, technology, progress is in America's bones. Um, and I think when you look at all the leading US or, or AI firms, most of them are in the US, most of them are based in the US, not just purely artificial intelligence firms, also the chip makers, which are critical to this technology. Um, one interesting thing I'm watching here is robotics, which I believe is like the physical manifestation of AI. It's how AI creeps into the real world. And, um, you know, this, this is something that we, we cover in the event. Uh, I'm super bullish on it. When you walk into a Tesla factory or an Amazon warehouse today, full of robots, right? What happens when that scales up to economy wide? What if robotics allow America to produce goods cheaper than China or Vietnam, right? That's that's a huge deal for America. It's a complete game changer. Um, zooming out, I think Europe is is a lost cause. Um, Europe is trying to trying to ban AI. It's raiding Nvidia offices in Paris and all this stuff. China well, what's for me. The deal is, with Europe? Why why does Europe hate everything that's new? Uh, I, the, I live in. You're you're the chief Europe person on this call, so you have to explain. <laughs> you, you represent Eric, the whole continent. Europe has turned into mu museum. They don't like anything that's new. They want to preserve everything just as is. Um, it's an incredibly hostile environment for new companies and new innovators, which is why. The Collison brothers, they're Irish, they started a company. What did they do? They moved to Silicon Valley. That's what any good European entrepreneur does. So for me, um, Europe is, is a lost cause. And I think it just has fallen into this mindset that we want to preserve everything that, it, that, that, you know, that is old. We want to preserve everything as it is. And you know, this new stuff, it's bad for climate change. It's bad for you know, uh, social, social mobility and stuff. So just let's, let's leave that to the Americans. So. I'm not bullish on Europe. You asked also about industries. And I think um, Mark Andreessen famously wrote in 2011, software is eating the world. AI is going to eat software, right? Um, I think you're going to see a lot of previous winners get disrupted. Uh, there's a new Silicon Valley that's going to emerge. And the thing I'm 
most bullish on. The thing I spend a lot of time thinking about is how AI is going to crack into healthcare and education, right? Two of America's most important, but also most broken industries. And, you know, we both have kids, Eric, and um, I think we would all be quite glad for um, some expert robo-tutor to, to take over. It's crazy to me that my kid's education is the same as mine and pretty much the same as my mother's. Something needs to be done here. So super bullish on that sector too. Yeah, at some point, do the people need to even be educated? If if the robots are doing the work and the AI is doing the work and you know you can have AI interviewing you, but you could just be an AI analyst, like do the people need to even be involved at all? Why, do they even have to learn anything? So I think I, I remember th- someone told me the quote, what's scarce is valuable, okay? And I think in the, in the age of AI where you can create endless content and, you know, there might be, you know, there, yeah, you're just, you're just going to be blasted in the face with all this stuff. The, the scarce thing will be personality, will be humans, will be, you know, uh, natural conversation. And you could, uh, on one hand, I can make a, a, a very compelling case for AI, which is I wake up every morning and there's 40 emails in my inbox and I have to figure out which ones to read. I'm just inundated with stuff. In the not too distant future, my personal AI is going to know exactly what I need to read and it's going to just show me those emails. And it's going to be the same on YouTube and it's going to be the same on Twitter. Um, and it's going to be the same in a lot of other places. Now, you can paint that as dangerous, but if used in the right way, it's actually, it brings us to a, a much better place than we're in today. What are some, and this, this is helpful, this is helpful to get your perspective on it. So, you know, based on that, there's got to be a lot of common questions you get from people or common misconceptions you get from people that they don't quite understand AI or they don't quite understand the impacts. Do you find that when you're having a normal conversation with a, with a regular person, not necessarily an industry analyst or AI expert. What do you find yourself having to explain over and over again? Yeah, so I think the number one thing, and we talked about it already, is that AI is just going to take all the jobs. And I really do not think that's true. Again, every technology in history um, has created more jobs than it's destroyed. And actually, I think there was a, there was a great study from uh, your, your alum, MIT, and it was 60% it was 60% of employment in 2018 did not exist in, in 1940. Those jobs did not exist. Again, technology just creates new jobs. I think the other one that people worry about is that it's going to wipe us all out. Uh, it's going to kill us. Um, AI is not, at least in its current form, is not some HAL 9000 uh, robot from 2001 A Space Odyssey. Um, it's a machine. It's not going to come alive. Um one for investors, maybe, Eric, or, or just even casual investors that I think pink, people think big tech is going to c- capture all the gains here and it's kind of just scraps left for everyone else, right? Don't even bother investing in all these AI startups or just small AI companies. I think that's completely wrong. I think AI is um, the great equalizer. It's extreme leverage. I'll give you the perfect example. Google has 190,000 employees, right? For the longest time, Eric, I was hearing Google is in the AI lead. That's the reason why OpenAI was started. Don't even bother competing with them. With 300 employees, OpenAI is wiping the floor with Google. So again, for for me, um, it's an extreme, it's a tool of extreme leverage. It's going to help startups compete with today's big tech joints. Um, And maybe the last one that that people kind of, you know, think is that AI is a fad. Again, I think people are jaded maybe from the last couple of years of the tech sell off in 2021, 2022 was a rough year. This is for real. For the longest time, AI was a fad, right? Um, but now you're actually seeing companies starting to make money. So uh, yeah, I think those are some of the common misconceptions people have about AI. So it sounds like you're very optimistic. You're very bullish. You think the stock market continues to rise. You think the economy continues to grow. More jobs will exist. AI is a good thing. You're you're a very, very happy guy in terms of your perspective on everything. You're with a big smile. Yeah, well, look, it's been it's been an incredible year. I mean, I'm always on my guard. And if prices um, you know, if prices start to go the other way, I have to respect the market. And I'll certainly, you know, when the facts change, I'll change my mind. But at least right now, I see every reason to be bullish. If I had to choose, I would say AI, AI specifically is underhyped right now. And under-hyped. I actually underhyped. 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 I think if you look, Eric, actually, great stuff for you. NVIDIA is trading way below its five year forward PA. Okay. So 
I don't think anyone can actually say NVIDIA is an expensive stock. And NVIDIA, which tripled its revenue over the past two years, or sorry, last year, year over year, tripled its revenue, um, is trading at a lower forward PE than Apple, which has not grown in two years. Um, so I would say people are actually quite skeptical still of, of AI companies. Anything else from the conference? And again, like we'll have that, that link here and in the description and everywhere so people can find it and click right to it. You know, in terms of like who who was someone you were surprised about in terms of what they said or you know who was there? Um, you know, a topic that that you you yourself you felt like you learned something new hearing some of these experts talk. Yeah, so we had Doug O'Loughlin on, and he's when I want the perspective on what's going on with chips, uh, I call up Doug. He, he, he's a great great um, source of knowledge, and he had a great lot to say about how the best analogy for the AI infrastructure phase that we're in right now is the telecom build out in the 90s, all right? And just so much money poured into creating all that fiber and um, and building out the internet. And it was obviously an incredible boom for people. So that was an interesting um, perspective, an interesting kind of analog that I hadn't thought about. And I I really think AI is the biggest thing since the internet, uh, maybe more so. We also talked to to Mark Yusko, um of Morgan Creek, and he had a, a lot to say about AI, uh, was incredibly bullish on it. He he kind of looks at companies maybe at an earlier stage in the, in the venture capital sector. So there, there's tons happening there. So overall, people are... Um, I think people are coming around to the idea that that this stuff is for real, right? It's not, it's not a fad. It's not a fact. I, th- I think you've scared me straight. I I haven't done enough with the models, the ChatGPT and, and Bard and all the other ones that are out there. Where should somebody start? Because you've said, I think sometimes it seems clunky or you're not really sure what exactly to tell it because you don't know what 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 you need it to do or you don't realize like, how can it really help me in a world where, okay, I've got my regular job, but I don't really see where I can get efficiencies out of it. So I would first of all say GPT-4, G- uh, GPT plus is by far the best AI model, right? There's that one you have to pay for, right? That one's not free, right? Sorry? You have to pay 20 bucks a month? Correct. But I, I'll give you a little hack, Eric. There is, a, there is a way you can access it for free, which is Microsoft Bing. So when you go to Bing chat, that is GPT-4 on the back end. So there you can access the best AI model that the world has to offer right now for absolutely free. And just for, for anyone listening, you know, uh, whatever you do, I would encourage you to think of a task that takes you um, a lot of time every day, something you don't necessarily like to do, and go and see, you know, play around with, fiddle around with, with being and see if it, can, if it can do that task for you. If it can, I've found it kind of does 90% of the work and 99% less time. Whether that's drafting emails, I, you know, I read this, this great, um, exchange about parents who, who were having uh, trouble with their, their kid in school and they used Bing to draft an email, which they tried to draft it and they were just like super emotional about it. Uh, they got they got Bing, GPT-4, to, to, to draft and everything was sorted. They sent it to the principal. So little, little things in everyday life like that, right? Again, this is so unique in the sense that it touches every single one of our lives. It's not like back in the 90s that we were kind of, we we're all like fiddling around with fiber. Right. Um, so, yeah, it, it's exciting times. This is great. I, I appreciate it, Stephen. Where can people find more about you? Is it, is it Risk Hedge? Is it riskhedge.com, riskhedge.net? What's the Twitter? Then is there a newsletter? And what are all the ways that people want to really uh, dig deep with you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Eric. I, I really enjoyed our discussion. So, if people want to learn more about me and us, they can go to riskhedge.com. Uh, I write a, a three times weekly uh, newsletter called The Jolt, uh, everything markets, everything life, uh, being a dad, all that all that good stuff, show, show people how to profit from disruption. Um, they can also follow me on Twitter, at Disruption Hedge. Uh, love, love talking to anyone who's skeptical about this stuff. And uh, yeah, it, it's a great time to be alive, Eric. You mentioned the kids, and it's funny you mentioned the email that it could send, but if only it could actually you know, discipline them, feed them dinner, <laughs> put them to bed, do their bath, have them not wake you up in the morning, then it could be real valuable to me. That, that's coming with the robots. Just, just watch Elon. Call up Elon and you'll have that ready for you. 
coming with the robots. Exactly. Then, then I'll be scared until until they're actually moving around in our house. I guess I'm safe. They can't they can't kill us until they're moving in our house. It's just a chatbot, right? It's just a yeah. chatbot. Just a chatbot. <laughs> Stephen, so good. Thanks for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you again for for my guest coming on the show. Thanks for watching. Of course, if you're hearing all this, trying to figure out what to do with your finances, with your family's finances, you can go to wealthyon.com. You can fill out the short form. It's just a quick email and we can connect you with investment professionals that we endorse, that that we know, we work with, we trust. So you can have a free conversation, no commitment, no obligation. You can just have a conversation with them to see if they're the right fit for you, right? If you don't have anyone you're working with right now, this could be an opportunity to help get your finances on track, your family's investments on track as well. Free public service that we provide at wealthyon.com. So you can check that out. And if and if you like this episode of Stephen and I, please like it, share it, forward, subscribe to the channel. Those are ways that the algorithm can pick it up and you know, send it to more people so we can really get this content out there and more people can learn and do a better job with their investing as well. So thanks again for watching Wealthy On. I'm Eric Chummy. We'll see you next time.